you're going to think it was easy. You know, oh, I want to be a Jedi. I'm like, yeah, you sure do. I bet. Right now, wait till you actually have to do the fight work in costume on stage live. Hi, I'm Matthew Corrado. I'm the owner and creator of Diamond Dragons, and you can visit my site at diamond-dragons.com and learn more about my series and my background in production, theater, and film. And you are watching or listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by a very multi-talented individual, of course, from the theater scene as well as entertainment. He is an author of an amazing series that we're going to talk about here today. We're joined by the ever-talented Matthew Carrudo, of course, from Diamond Dragons. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, Kurt. I appreciate it. It's great having you on. You know, we, we were talking in the green room a bit and we have very similar interests, so it's going to be a fun conversation overall. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Yeah, great. Well, again, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's always great to do these kind of uh, interviews and whatnot where, you know, you just have two different artists of different backgrounds and everybody's got all these different like bodies of knowledge. It's it's really fun for me. That's actually my favorite part about being involved over all these years is just working with different creative talents and, you know, combining strengths, if you will. People can find out more about my work if they just visit the website, which again is diamond-dragons.com. I kind of have over 30 plus years of work in general idea of production. And what do I mean by that? I mean like acting, directing, producing, sound design. I designed over 9,000 sounds. It's over 9,000! It's a lot of different work that I've done. I've uh, done electronic props, mostly in the form of LED lightsaber props, which, you know, detect the motion and they make the collision sounds. And these were custom electronics, not store-bought items and this was also back in the day when the technology to make these things just just wasn't there it was, it was basically around like 2004 5 and 6 those those uh, years and whatnot so we're going back in time um, to explain that portion of things but i also did a, a lot of costuming work as well i would suit up as darth vader and kylo ren of course you know luke skywalker and all these different kind of characters even characters from other series uh, depending on events, I was uh, did a really fantastic Alucard from uh, Castlevania Symphony, Symphony of the Night. For those people who are not familiar, that's okay. But, you know, like certain video games, I was uh, Link a couple of times <laughs> from Zelda. I tried to specialize in making sure that the costumes and the weaponry that I would be wearing would be a little bit more interesting on the technological, uh, technological side. There's just sort of a breadth of work that I've done. Um, nothing super high level, professional, like, you know, I'm not a Hollywood mogul or anything like that. But also, and I might as well say this now, but people can visit the website to find out more. A portion of my background was in saber fencing. I was, of all things, a, uh, a saber fencing instructor and athlete, and I'm a medaled athlete. I, I have about, I don't know, something like 12 plus medals, you know, golds and silvers and bronzes. Nothing Olympic, just to make sure that people don't think, oh, well, he's just so hot to talk to you about his stuff. I'm like, no, I'm just saying is that I didn't just grab a sword and start playing around. It's like, you know, you got to actually study in some cases. Um, and so that kind of brought to the table my background in staged combat, which swords sort of melds into, you know, my background in martial arts and whatnot. So, you know, that's a lot to say, perhaps, but at least that might paint a picture for your audience and any listeners right now who, uh, you know, kind of want to know, well, what's this guy all about? Is he just an author? And, you know, I'd have to say, you know, unequivocally, no, <laughs> you know, I am not just doing the writing and the illustrations and the editing and the formatting on my books, although that is a lot of work. You know, a lot of my background has come from production, acting, directing. Well, we'll talk about drag, uh, Diamond Dragons itself because that's that's what we're here for ultimately, and uh, and we'll touch on your other amazing extensive experience as well as we're going through these questions here today for sure, because I'm sure it all ties together in your creative repertoire of what you've put together here. But what is Diamond Dragons all about? Because I'm sure a lot of people are really curious about it. Because I love dragons. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fantasy nerd and geek. You know, I got Dragonlance when I was at a thrift shop up in Toronto there's you know that got me onto the fantasy scene but what is Diamond Dragons all about? 
No, it's a great question, Kurt. And I know some people might say, well, that's the obvious one. People will just say, well, it's, what is Diamond Dragons? But it's, it's a good question because um, what I'd like to start with is say that for me, storytelling is like inspiration. It's the inspiration that has come from everything that has made you, you up to that point. And that can include, and I'm talking about everybody in this case, not just myself. When you see a movie, when you read a book, when you read a comic book, when you see a play, on stage. Maybe not all of them will leave some kind of imprint on you as an individual or artist or whoever you are, but I would argue that some things, at the very least, if not most of the things, will leave some kind of residual impact on you. When we think of this kind of stuff, like there's Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I wasn't a huge Dungeons and Dragons player in terms of the tabletop kind of things. I did a little bit of it with friends, but I remember being amazed by like looking through these monster compendiums some people will understand what i'm saying when i say that too they'll be like what's a monster compendium that sounds like a big word I'm like you know it's just a book of the types of creatures you could encounter and the artwork was just uh, smashing just unbelievable most of the time you know you wouldn't just see a goofy little drawing that it looked like you know some six-year-old scribbled together and you know five minutes flat, it looked like they hired some serious Drew Struzan, Ralph McQuarrie style artists, you know, which is, that's great. You know, if anybody doesn't know who Drew Struzan is and Ralph McQuarrie, that's fine too. But we'll just say you could look up Star Wars at the least. Uh, doesn't mean that they were solely involved in Star Wars. So that was a, a lot of the, the backgrounds. And I'll kind of say this, it's kind of giving away a tiny secret, but like I kind of worked in a way to import a caco demon uh, into the Diamond Dragon series. There is a Hydra. There are elementals, like uh, earth elementals, rock elemental, things that you would be like, oh yeah, that, that sounds like something that would come from a Dungeons and Dragons style thing. And then kind of still going back in time with the video game industry, I was super inspired as a, as a young boy from games like Ultima, which some people will not be familiar with this series, but some people will. This was from Origin Systems and Richard Gary and Star Long. But most importantly, I loved Ultima 4 and 5. A lot of the reasons for this is storytelling underpinnings, the thematic underpinnings that were placed into those games were fantastic. They had these spiritual motifs, not religious motifs, where the game wasn't simply, yeah, go around, kill all the monsters, kill more monsters, get more gold. It's like, okay, that we've done that. So there was more to the storytelling. I just found that amazing. And then other games that even survive to this day by a fellow named John Van Kanigam of uh, New World Computing, which is of course now long defunct. He made the Might and Magic series, oh. which then developed into Heroes of Might and Magic, which even to this day, Players are still playing Heroes of Might and Magic 3 very strongly. And apparently the successors who have grabbed up that series, they're doing a new version, something called Heroes of Old or something, Olden Times, I don't know, something like that. So it's like some of these things that, you know, were way back in the 70s or 80s or whatever that some people went, oh, whatever, it's just some silly game. I'm like, they developed into something huge, you know, games like The Legend of Zelda, Castlevania, Metroid, you know, all these things. So, Kurt, where a lot of the things that I've kind of placed into Diamond Dragons came from were sort of inspirations from this stuff, Tolkien, you know, Spielberg, Lucas, William Goldman, I mean, Shakespeare, Edmund Rostin, who did uh, Cyrano de Bergerac. So <laughs> there's just a lot of underpinnings that I've then lifted and sort of integrated into my storytelling. Getting back to Diamond Dragons itself, it is a story primarily of dragons. Most of the characters are dragons, and I kind of always wanted to do that for many years, and now I finally got my opportunity. Around 2018 and 19, I was like, I'm gonna write this screenplay. I would just wanna write the screenplay first, and we'll see where it goes from there. Then COVID-19 hit, but I went, well, Everybody's been saying, maybe you should do a book of it, Matthew, instead of these screenplays. They're, what are you going to do with the screenplay? You know, no one's going to make a movie out of it. You need billions of dollars and hundreds of connections. I'm like, that's true. That's kind of what I did, Kurt, is I decided, okay, I'm going to go all in and I'll try doing this book. And if I attempt starting it, I'm going to finish it, even if I don't exactly know how it's going to turn out, which I didn't. You know, I had written plays before. I had written my own productions before, which I performed live on stage, which again, people can find out online. I had written poetry, lots of it. I'd written short stories 
and even some plays, uh, usually based on other people's uh, work or whatever, just more of as an experiment, but things I wished I could see sometimes, you know, you don't get all your productions done, but I had never written a like legitimate book. So when I went down that road, just part of who I am, I was like, well, if I start this, you know, part of my French, but I was like, I'm not fucking gonna quit on it or I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. So it's funny, even when I was saying to some people, I'm like, I'm thinking about writing a book. They said, you've been saying that for like a month or two. I'm like, yeah, I know. Cause it's not a, <laughs> this is not a small little paper cup of, of drink. This is like a waterfall. <laughs> If I do this, people never really thought it through when they were like, oh, come on, Matthew, how hard could it be? You should just write a book. I'm like, when you say you should just write a book, I already know you don't. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be pretentious, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You don't know. Because have you written, have you done a book before? And they're like, uh, well, no. I'm like, then maybe you shouldn't be telling people how to do it. And oftentimes when I'm that abrasive or whatever with people, they'll look at me like, oh, what a jerk. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I'm being a jerk when it's it's screwed up. It's pretentious, Kurt. It'd be like if someone told you in the sound industry, but they had no experience in sound and they start telling you, you should this, this, this. You'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? You don't have an experience in this. Why are you giving me advice in something you don't have experience in? So anyway, I know I've kind of gone on and on, but um. Yeah, it was it was a big deal. Like when I was starting it, I was pretty I don't want to say scared is not the right word. But I was like, man, this is a lot of work. Like, I don't know, man, I'm gonna do it now that I committed. I'm like, I'm gonna do it. But I'm like, I gotta make sure to finish. That was the biggest strongest thing for me that I'm like, I am not going to fail this like it's gonna get done. So when I set a deadline, which ended up being I decided on the solstices of all things, and those actually play into the books. The solstices become a part in the storytelling of the books, but then I also decided to use those as my release dates, just for fun. The dragons encounter solstices and celestial events, eclipses, you know, all these kind of interesting, you know, magical times kind of thing. By setting those dates as my deadlines, that was it. I was like, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to miss my deadlines. I want to hit them. And I have 100% of the time, you know, knock on whatever you want, wood and stuff. 2021 summer solstice, I released the digital version of Diamond Dragons 1. Then the winter solstice, I released the print versions, which are more like these covers. This is actually obviously Diamond Dragons 3, but you get the idea. Yeah. So 2021 solstices, 2022 solstices for book two and 2023s. And here we are in 2024. Summer solstice has already come and gone. I released half purposely, even though I'm done with the book, half of Diamond Dragons 4. And then for the winter, I'll release the full print versions. And then I have planned Diamond Dragons 5 and 6. So it's it's the idea is that it's a hexology. We'll see if I go further after that, but it's it's pretty guaranteed that unless I you know, unless I die, sorry, I'm dead. <laughs> unless I die, then there'll be uh, six total books in the series. It's possible I'll consider doing like seven through 12. Mm -hmm. But I was like, when people ask, I'm like, oh, oi, oi, Gavalt, I don't know if I have the strength. So give me the, the elevator pitch of Diamond Dragons. Uh, okay, so the first book is fairly simple to quickly express. It's, you know, sort of an ancient society of heroic dragons are racing against time to reach this sort of creature of legend, a firebird, a phoenix, if you will, before their enemies, the bone and ghost dragons, find it and either imprison, destroy, or enslave it. That's pretty much the idea. Now, that's just what we call in the business a race for the MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. And if people don't understand what the hell a MacGuffin is, and that's okay, it's just a generic word, like saying that's a widget and that's a thingy thongy or whatever. The race for the MacGuffin is just like in Mission Impossible. In Mission Impossible, you know, it's you got to get the codes and people are like, what the hell is the codes? And like, they're the codes, man, you got to get the codes. And, you know, you don't always know like, wait, what the hell do these codes really do? <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, it doesn't really matter. But as you can see, the good guys and the bad guys really want them. And so you got to get it first. And who's going to get it first? I don't know. And then maybe one guy gets it, but then he gets punched in the face and then he catches it, moves on. Then the good guy gets, you get the idea. This is a little like that, but also people can think that it's the, it's modeled loosely around the fellowship story and two towers and return of the king. They basically will have to go to a volcano to some extent. 
Uh, and again, remember, I'm kind of, you know, blasting through this, truncating the story, obviously. But the goal is, you know, get there and find this magical creature first. And then what happens is kind of anybody's guess. That's just Diamond Dragons 1. There's obviously a story for 2 and 3 and so on. You need a jumping off point. You need a starting point, obviously, for a series. And the fact that you've, you've explained it in wonderful detail, I love the fact that, like, I'm excited to, to pick it up and to... Oh, good. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'm more of a, a digital reader myself these days. Behind the green screen here, I have a ton of books that I've, I've collected over the decades. And it's like, awesome. you, you have your favorites and you have your series and you have the genres you like and you enjoy here. Out of these six books, then, that you've built up this world specifically, what has been the most challenging aspect about maintaining the consistency of the world you built right that's a really good question and uh, really quick just on that note a minute ago when you mentioned digital versus print i will at least say this for people that yeah th there are digital versions of my books but they are missing a lot of the illustrations just so people understand that the bulk of the illustrations are located in the print versions and that's obviously for good reason in the digital versions it was actually not only did i not really want to put them all in there but it was just simply impossible for five file size reasons. Uh, but getting back to your, your question. So as a creator, when you're making something that is kind of beyond yourself, and what I mean by that is you're not writing a tiny short story with three characters in it that you can just handle all up here, where you can just, I just know everything. I, I know everything about my world. But it's like when you think of a, a books like Lord of the Rings, you know, I'm 100% certain that Tolkien was making notes and leaving this thing and that thing here and keeping his materials organized so he would know what's the eye color of this character what's their hair like what weapons do they carry and what weapons do they not carry do they carry a shield do they not blah 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 i mean it could be anything do they have a horse do they not have a... whatever whatever you cannot keep all that stuff in your head if you can that's great but i would say that that's an outlier a person who somehow has a lot more going on in their head and that's not as normal for most humans right most <laughs> humans have a finite memory <laughs> um so i do i i've i've kept this organized but over the 30 years that i've done my projects i sort of learned my own systems if you will kurt on how i go about being like oh okay i better keep a i mean it's pretty obvious if i say this but if i say i gotta keep a, a list a cast of characters that's pretty obvious but then some people won't think and go like oh yeah he needs to not only mention their eye color, but like their wing color in this case, like they're different. Uh, do these dragons breathe fire or does this one breathe ice? Does this one do this? Does this one do that? Is this one more like this? Is this one more like, maybe their personalities? Maybe in this case, he also lists their purpose, not in the books, not saying this character, their purpose is this. That would be silly. But from my intents and the storytelling, I need to mark what character is doing what. Like, for example, character archetypes are a huge part of all storytelling, and you find them in all heroes' journeys. And let me give some examples really quick, right? When you think of Luke Skywalker, Neo from The Matrix, Frodo from uh, Harry uh, I almost said Harry Potter, what am I saying? <laughs> Frodo from Lord of the Rings and Harry from Harry Potter, which are, those are all heroes journeys those are the blank slates they start off a little bit more like you or and i you're supposed to sort of relate to that character because they have no character in the beginning and i don't mean that in a, a disparaging way i just mean that they start as poor farm boys nobodies right neo was just a worker in a generic company nobody knows and nothing frodo was a farm boy still he, you know some people say he wasn't like luke skywalker i'm like think about it he was on in the shire basically living at Bilbo's house. You don't really know if he has a major perfect. He's not like, I am the king of the hobbits or <laughs> it's none of these things, right? He's just a boy. He's just a boy. And Harry, I mean, Harry Potter, we don't need to sit there and go into, well, but he was a wizard. I'm like, yeah, but he started off as like a little slave boy in a stairwell or whatever the hell. I don't know. The point is, these are archetypes. And then they have to grow an arc into an actual character. And let's also talk about the wizards in there, the wise men, right? You have Gandalf. It's pretty obvious. He's an old wise man wizard. He knows a lot. He will impart that information. But doesn't that sound an awful lot like Dumbledore, and you also have Obi-Wan Kenobi, Morpheus, right? Do you want to know what it is? You know, it's like, so what are we seeing here? Are we seeing some patterns now? Yes, of course. So those need to be present in what I like to call 
exemplary storytelling, or at least good storytelling, if you're just doing a competent job, it's fine. So we see those things in all of these, and we do the same for Diamond Dragons, not by accident, not by happenstance, not by luck, but by design. You have to plan out your books and your series and your creative projects. I mean, if you're a, a genius and you have the ability to keep everything up in your head, then amazing, great, congrats. But I have an Excel spreadsheet every time I run something or I create something where I have tabs and I'm just like a Google Docs or something where I'm sharing and collaborating and working with other people, creative people, in the sense of how can we get this project done and completed on time, under budget, and that we're all happy with so that we can share it with the masses. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's really important too, like efficiency. Uh, people don't think about this sometimes. They think, okay, you're a story to, oh, this, when's the next movie coming out? And how come this? And why hasn't George R. R. Martin released the blah, 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 I won and I won it. And it's funny, even Stephen King said it. He says, they're like babies. They, they want it now. Gimme, gimme. I want, where's my, I want my toy. I want my bear now, 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 mine, mine. And the, the issue with it is it's like, it's one thing when you have a team of monkeys and <laughs> elves and slaves working for you. I mean, I'm joking here, but people will hopefully understand. They'll be like, if you're a corporation and you have a team of eight writers, I'm not saying you have no excuse, but you kind of have no excuse because you're like, you can collaborate and organize that information quickly, get it done and shoot it out there, boom, into the wild it goes. But when you are just a single individual, which I am, and I don't really have a team. Sure, I, I've hired some artists to do some artwork and these things here and there, but it's there's 350 plus non-AI illustrations in my books so far, books one through four. I didn't uh, hire people to do 350 things. I would have gone broke a long time ago. I had to do most of this stuff myself. The editing, I do all myself. And I, that means all of it, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, proof reading. It's a lot of work. Formatting, we do all that. Most of the cover designs, it's my own work. It's kind of a pain. It takes work. So if I were to set a deadline and I was incorrect about my assessment into the future, I would miss it. I would definitely miss it, right? When I set my deadlines, I have to be smart enough to project one far enough away that I'm like, it's plausible, but I also don't want to be like, oh, well, you know, Kurt, I guess, uh, what do you think? Um, three years and I'll write this book. And you'd be like, oh, okay. You're going to write a book every three years? I mean, okay, but is that really industry standard? Is that how you would want to see books being uh, churned out from an author? And for me, I just was like, uh, I don't want to make it too easy on myself. I don't want to be like, I'm going to do a book in three months. I, <laughs> that would be... Well, that would be a little tough. So I didn't, you know, I didn't shoot for that. But when I set myself on the solstices, I was like six months to a year, but six months for the digital and then more time to just really get all the illustrations in, make sure all the little, you know, whatever you want to call it, dot the I's, cross the T, that kind of thing for the winter solstices it is important for me to set deadlines and then work very hard every day with these systems in mind you know like i have my checklists kurt nobody will see all that that's the that's as they say right there's the tip of the iceberg and then there's all the stuff underneath and they don't need to see that you don't need to see how um james cameron's the abyss was done you can now see the behind the scenes and see that that was like they just that's why they literally made t-shirts that said the abuse on it it takes a a lot of work and when you're an individual it's a mountain that if you're going to fall, you're falling on your own. Nobody's there to catch you. Like if I was going to fail these books, who would I blame? Kurt, me, right? If they do well when people read them, then I blame myself. <laughs> I'd be like, I did well because of my fault. <laughs> that was my fault, you know, or I, I did poorly. That was my fault. That's kind of the give and take for these kinds of things is like, you have to work hard. You have to have systems in place. It's very difficult. And also you have to think of it like this too, Kurt. If I didn't know what I was doing in terms of storytelling, oh, it would be uh, catastrophically worse because then I would be um, writing scenes and then floundering and then deleting them and then writing some more scenes and doing stuff, keeping some, but then deleting a whole bunch of other stuff. And you're like, you're kind of taking eight steps forward and three back every single time. It's like, why not just wait, chill out, organize, then decide, hmm, yes, this scene is going into the book. It's not going to leave. I'm writing this scene. Sure, you're going to go back and edit it, but 
don't write something if you are not 99% certain that you're going to basically keep it. Yes, you can edit it. Yes, clip it down. But the worst thing I've ever heard, Kurt, and I hear this a lot when I go on all these online forums and you know, listen to what writers had to say. I try to help anybody out. Hey guys, I'm just frustrated because I was writing for three months and I wrote 30,000 words and now I just found it's all crap and I hate it and this and I delete it all and this. I'm like, oh my God, you wrote 30K and you dumped all of it? Wow, that'd be like you going to work, Kurt, for a month and you're just not going to get paid for any of those days because it's a wash. It's not a good feeling. Right? Most people don't know about all the behind the scenes. They only think director, actor, producer. That's all that goes into a movie. And you're like, there's also camera operators. Yeah. There might be. <laughs> and every production is different. Like, for example, and I got a lot of things that will float in my mind about the film and theater and all that stuff industry. Let's talk about the Coen brothers. The Coens are notorious for being like, they'll cut. No, no. The line is this. If you change a word, yeah. a word. They'll be like, could you not do that? You know, they're not like jerks about it or whatever, but they're like, can you please stick to the script? Like, don't add a loop. <laughs> people will be like, whoa, I've never worked with anything. Like, usually these people, and it's like, yeah, but the Coens don't do that. I'm not trying to say, well, okay, look at their work, but yeah, look at their work. And it's like, gee, I wonder why. Why do they do this with Raising Arizona, The Big Lebowski, No Country for Old Men? <sighs> you know, like, why do you think that they do this kind of stuff? It's because they're very specific. They plan all this stuff out. They've kind of w worked out all the kinks of let's sort of find it. And can you guys improvise and we'll just see and we'll find out. That's not bad, by the way. I'm just saying is that is definitely not efficient. If you're going to say, let's play around and do 28 takes, because then in the editing room, the editor's going, oh my God, like what, which, which take? And okay, on this one, he raises his glass, but in the second shot, he's down here. Come on, like, how am I supposed to put this together? Production is not easy and it's helpful if people organize ahead of time and think ahead of time and plan ahead, not to say that you will do everything exactly the way that everything is planned. Sometimes you, you do some stuff on the spot. It's better to have a plan. And I sometimes liken it to like building a building. Why would you ever, in the name of Zeus's mom, ever think that you were going to build a building? Just namby pamby run out there and start putting up girders and beams people be like what the hell are you doing you got to plan so i liken it to that kurt is like for me i need to know the endings of my books before i even really begin on really fleshing out the whole thing sure i might write some scenes where i'm like i know this scene needs to happen but if i don't have the ending i won't really be hungrily approaching writing the book because i'm like if i don't have the end zone in mind where am i going where are my characters going? And I think that's a very intelligent way to look at it. And for me, this has been super important for the Diamond Dragon series and almost every production I've done. I've almost always wanted to know where am I going to take these characters? Where am I going to take my cast? You know, if it's actually a cast of human beings on stage doing a production. Like when I did my live fight scenes, I was like, you know, we, we're going to take you somewhere. You know, you're going to go on a journey. You're going to learn some fight work. You're going to go through a marathon. You're going to think it was easy. You know, oh, I want to be a Jedi. I'm like, yeah, you sure do. I bet. Right now, wait till you actually have to do the fight work in costume, on stage, live, this location, that location, that one. Then you're going to come back to me and be like, wow, Matthew, I wanted to be a Jedi. But now that I've done it, I don't know if I want to do that again. I'm going, <laughs> I'm going right? They're like, you're, you're one and done. Often it's the small details that make a big impact. What seemingly minor character or world building element has had a significant effect on your overall story? Oh, there's so many. Um, let me think real quick. Uh, buh, buh, buh. Oh, I will just take Bardish or Bardish. Depends on how people want to say it. Bard is a character who is literally a minstrel. And when I first envisioned him for Diamond Dragons, when I knew exactly what his purpose was going to be, and it was going to be great, he was part of the comedic break that the audience gets, right? He gets to throw in the zingers and the one-liners and the kind of whimsy and, and fun of Diamond Dragons when a lot of the storytelling is, of course, dramatic and, and uh, harsh and, and hard. But as a minstrel dragon, I also knew that he was going to have a significant impact on the remainder of the stories to come. 
he's a minor character in Diamond Dragons 1, but in Diamond Dragons 2, he gets kind of boosted up. And by 3 and 4, you'll learn a lot more about him. But he's definitely one of my favorite characters that I've made of this series because he is so much fun. Sometimes he'll speak with alliteration. He'll speak in rhymes. Not always. I didn't want to make it some ridiculously annoying thing. It's because he is a poet. And that's what his job is a lot of times is in the tavern when they're all just, you know, chilling out and relaxing after whatever happened that day. If there was something good, bad, whatever. He's playing music. He's uh, singing songs. He's uh, telling stories and all this stuff. He definitely grew on me, and there were ways where his character surprised me as I was, you know, writing the work and doing more. I knew some things, but then one day I would be like, oh my God, oh my God, obviously, obviously he needs to say and do these, okay, this is going to be great. So those would be these wonderful little tiny, mostly minor though, epiphanies that would come along the way, and they just lifted the stories even more. Uh, with everything but people will find out really quickly diamond dragons one you don't have to pay attention to bard at all if you don't want he's a minor character no big deal and so is jig then in two people will be like oh what the hell is this thing with him at the waterfall and playing the what is that well i don't understand by three they're gonna be like oh my god this is crazy and then by four i'm assuming they're just gonna be like Ah, uh, you know, just the whole time sitting there going like, I can't believe this was under my nose the entire time. And in a way, it was under all of the characters' noses, all the dragons. This was going on the whole time, and they didn't know it, and you didn't know it, but then you did as the reader, and then they did as the characters in the actual story that you are, you know, looking at from a dragon's eye view, and so on. So yeah, Bard... He definitely impressed me. And in a way, so did Gargigal, Jig. People would be like, who are all these weirdos? Yeah, impressive stuff. I'm particularly proud about one sort of setup and payoff that I did with this other character I just mentioned, Gargigal. I won't go into what it is. It's pretty powerful, you know? I would also argue this too, Kurt, is that some things, they will not catch on the first read by design. And in other cases, I'll be like, man, if they're looking really hard and they're looking really close, they'll catch these things along the way, which is a good thing. They'll get like a bonus, <laughs> if you will, as they read through all of the stories. But there's huge bonuses to be had if people read the stories again. And I would liken that to the same thing. Like if you were to watch the Matrix trilogy, again, you might catch little details that you didn't see. Same thing with Star Wars, uh, the originals, of course, like 1977, 80, 83, and Lord of the Rings, whether you're reading the books or watching the films, you would catch things that you didn't see before. And I think that's always a, a sign of well-crafted work, right? Where you can't catch everything the first time. And it almost feels like, wait, I wasn't meant to see this the first time. Like I shouldn't feel bad that I didn't catch this. That's that's also a thing. Cause it's one thing if you're a bad storyteller and you, <laughs> you can't follow the story at all, <laughs> that's not a good sign. <laughs> but what I'm talking about are the little minor things that later you're like, wait i didn't even realize that he gave her that thing it was just so subtle they just made that little thing and wait that's how it was in the books i didn't even think about that just minor things that they don't matter to the the greater picture you don't need to know it but if you do discover them you'll be like oh, that is so cool like what the hell did they wait is are you a good witch or a bad witch can you describe a moment when you realized you needed to make a major change to your initial vision for the series? This is a good question, but I would also say real quick is that I haven't run into that situation and there's a reason for it. This kind of goes back to the idea of planning ahead. It's one thing if you, someone were to say, let's make a distinction. Did you make minor changes to something or major changes? To me, that's a huge distinction. Obviously I've made minor changes, but never anything major. The plot events, the major conflicts, the major exchanges where it's like this character must meet with this one and this has to happen and this and they have to go here and this, this, this. A hundred percent like pretty much plan them ahead and then when I've written them into the story at whatever whatever order I do it, because I don't always write uh, what we would call contiguously, in other words in order, sequentially if you will, they stay. And there's a good reason for this which is I, I don't like to do anything and that this is just also to my whole life I'm, I'm not interested in doing something if there's going to be no outcome or we're going to delete that later <laughs> i won't write a scene if i don't think that the scene's going to almost 100 percent chance be in the work 
Now, that doesn't mean I might not outline and be like, oh, okay, should I have Dupre and Jack Ralphie and they're going to meet, they're going to this, that, and the other, and this is going to, oh, okay. Then I might put that aside. But then I might come back to that note and I'll be like, that ain't going to happen. That's that's a terrible way to do that. No, we're not doing that scene, right? So like I've only written maybe a bullet point on something that maybe hashtag question mark question mark will occur at a certain time but then i'll go back and be like no that got covered in this other way more powerful scene that's way better and that's kind of how i work so i never change anything major because i feel like if i did do that i messed up really badly <laughs> like you know like i didn't plan enough ahead that would then cause me to have to delete I don't know, you just make up the amount of words, 3,000, 12,000, 30K, and it's horribly inefficient and I can't afford to do that for my own purposes and time. I have to be efficient and keep working on it. Writers often talk about characters speaking to them and I've had many conversations over the years, especially in entertainment, especially with comic creators and the like, where they said, yeah, my characters just tell me what to do and it, it works out great. What is the most unexpected way your characters have surprised you? First of all, I do believe in that. Like, I know a lot of people might think it's silliness when a writer or a creator says something like, my characters speak to me. It makes it sound weird or pretentious or something, but it's really not like that flat of an idea. It's almost like when people say, show, don't tell. That's not a, an accurate way of explaining how to be a good storyteller, but it is like a tiny little truncated blurb. When people are talking about my character speak to me, they're not trying to be like, I'm some esoteric weirdo and I listen to the clouds or something like that. Let me explain it a little bit as an actor. As an actor, sometimes you'll be placed into a scene and then you start working on the scene with the other actor and maybe the director has put you in a position where it's not powerful. Maybe you're supposed to be in an aggressive and angry state, but the director is accidentally, or I would almost say amateurishly, put you in a position where you're weak. You don't have the impetus to get there. So that's not a good thing. So then oftentimes it's like you have to kind of figure out, well, what will get you there? Okay, what gets you to that place? That way the scene feels legitimate. It feels genuine. It feels like the emotions are real and they're not a facsimile and, and forced and sort of like screw hold in, you know, like someone has just made them say this. And we see this to this day, Kurt. This is, by the way, not easy. I don't want to call out anything directly here because I'm sure it'll come to bite me in the butt, but we've all seen productions from Hollywood and Amazon and other Disney, whatever, where productions seem forced. The lines are poorly crafted. What's worse is the exchanges between the two human beings who are giving the lines or creatures, what, whatever. They just don't read right, you know? So it's like, from my perspective as an actor, what I often have to do is be like, okay, in my mind, I'm going to set this character and this character in the same room. Right now, that can be an amorphous location. Like, I don't know where this location is yet, at least in my mind. They need to have a conversation. But the question is, what is that conversation? Are they in person or is it like a radio communication? But the point being is like, we're setting more an amorphous thing. Kurt and Matthew need to talk and they need to talk about this particular subject, but other ones will probably eat their way in there. What's gonna happen? How's it gonna start? Is one person gonna be more like, so Kurt, yeah, you finally got what you wanted, huh? Right? Isn't that right? You little pretentious jerk. Are we starting with that amount of vitriol and, and venom? Or is it more like they just come in and go like, yeah, you wanted to talk to me? <laughs> it, it depends. So then what I try to call on is make sure that in my mind, I know what these characters are. I should if I'm the creator of them. If I don't, that's a problem. I need to know what my characters would and would not say. But at the same time, they can sort of, as the conversation happens, they can surprise me. I can have it where one just reaches out and psh, slaps the other one in the face. How dare you? Don't even try that with me. That kind of thing, you know? And I might be like, uh, is that right? I don't know if I want to have that character do that. And I'll be like, no, they, they would do that under this circumstance. Is that powerful? Is that good? So I'll kind of go down that road sometimes, Kurt. Now, Will I always do that? No. Sometimes it's inappropriate for the storytelling and all the ways things are to go to put these two people in a box or whatever. You know what I'm trying to get at. 
So it's sort of like I let the character speak to me and then sometimes a really excellent scene will come of it. What's most important is does that also drive the storytelling and the character arcs forward? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't and it takes everything on a sideline, it might be interesting all on its own, but it might not be appropriate for the storytelling. And that is difficult to communicate to audiences right now if they don't have experience with it. Because that's an easy way to get your characters to wander in the wrong direction. Right. It's also an easy way that you can accidentally almost, I don't want to say end your story early, but you can, right? If you put the wrong characters in the wrong time at the wrong place, you end up getting your hero killed. And you're like, well, wait, did I intend that? And some people might say, go with it. It sounds cool. And da, da, da. it's like, yeah, but you might have broken your story. Do you really want to do that at this moment? And maybe the answer is yes, but what if it's not? Then you shouldn't do it. <laughs> right. So it's like, you have to be judicious about it. But I feel it's, it is important to listen to your characters. When one of your characters is screaming at you basically in the back of your mind going like, I would never let that character do this and that and the other because of this, you should probably listen at the least. Or you may have to say, ooh, it's actually powerful that in the back of their mind they are screaming for this to happen, but they know they can't, their buddies know they can't, the bad guys definitely know they can't do this right they're not going to be able to do this or they'll screw themselves over or whatever so maybe it's important that if a character does speak to you you do listen but then you might say yeah i know you're angry hold on to that thought for a good 30 120 minutes it builds tension so there are times where i feel that it's good to listen to your characters but it's other times where you're like it's probably better that we don't do what this character wants right now and people might say why is that your character wants it he's like it's because they want it that they shouldn't get it i think that's something that nowadays need to understand and know it's not just about characters but it's about good writing good approaches to writing and crafting you know believable dialogue and conflicts and resolutions and I think if you can do that as a writer, then that works out very well for whatever industry you're in. Yeah, I find that exceptionally important. And that's just me as a storyteller. I'm not going to tell other people how to do their work. Well, unless they ask me if they say, hey, I need some help. Will you give me some advice? I've seen on sometimes groups where people will ask advice. So then I go into advice mode. Then sometimes you give them advice and they're like, why are you telling me this? And no, 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 no. And how? I'm like, then what'd you ask for? <laughs> like, I get it. If you're fighting what you're hearing, that's okay. You can do that. You don't need to be rude about it, though. And here's the other thing is, if you're not willing to accept advice, don't ask, you know, and more to the point, if you're going to ask for advice, you might want to specify if you're like, I want to hear from storytellers who have done this and that and the other, and who aren't just some fly by night person who thinks they know about storytelling, because I've seen all too much of that. And right, Kurt, we already talked about that subject is like, imagine a high school student just fresh out of theater and film trying to give examples of why uh, Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List was just not filmed well. You'd be like, what? Wait, I want to hear this. Come on, go on. And then you'd hear their arguments and you'd be like, I'm sorry, but 100% of your arguments are invalid. They don't even make any sense. I know they do to you, but you're wrong. And here's why. And then if you pointed all those out, they might not be capable of understanding why they're wrong. But that's just the Dunning-Kruger effect smashing into your face and whatnot. From me, my perspective, storytelling is more than just playtime, uh, by far. Just like uh, boxing is nothing so barbaric as trading punches. It's stupid, like anybody who thinks that. You're, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. Storytelling is a professional process. I'm sure that a lot of people might have gotten the opposite uh, feeling of it when they watch a movie. Ah, this is just a bunch of garbage. I'm like, well, yeah, it might be to you. And maybe the people who did the production, they weren't really thinking straight and they were just thinking about making some money. But then you have people, Edmund Rostand, Cyrano de Bergerac. What a beautiful story. Shakespeare's work, Much Ado About Nothing to this day, is one of my favorite storytelling pieces that essentially almost teach you about excellent storytelling. In Much Ado About Nothing, it contains my favorite moment of all time in all theater, film, writing, or whatever, of taking an audience from the highest level of tension and just, oh my godness, boom, right into comedy. In Much Ado About Nothing, they've woven this illusion over the main hero that we're following. He's going to marry this girl. Some devious guys say, she's screwing around with the, all these other men and she's this and that and the other. And they've got them convinced of this. They've said, don't get rid of her now. On the wedding day, you tell her off. 
So he does. And the audience is just sitting there going, oh my God. He literally says, give not this rotten orange to your friend. And you're like, okay. And he's telling that to the father of the bride. Then arguments and yelling and screaming ensue. And it's the kind of thing that when it's done right for a play, it's ludicrously stressful. Right, Kurt? Where you're literally showing a wedding scene where the groom is like, you and you're, you are a, you know, and you're like, ah, and you know it's coming as the audience, but the characters don't know that, you know? Sure enough, Shakespeare being Shakespeare, he's got Benedict and Beatrice in there, the kind of comic duo. Benedict's looking at the arguments and they're going, how dare you? And he goes, and he just leans over his friend. He's like, this looks not like a nuptial. You know, this doesn't look like a wedding I ever seen before. <laughs> it's such a great way to take the tension at such a high level where everybody's stressed and seeing these people argue and then for him to just drop that comedic bomb on you. And even people like Tarantino do that. Oh man, I shot Marvin in the face. It's more crude from Pulp Fiction. It's where they're taking the tension and changing it into comedy and then shifting gears. It's a sign of when people are doing some masterful work, even if sometimes it's not the way you wanted to see it, that's probably a good sign that the director or writer knows what they're doing. These are the moments that make theater and performance and film and books and storytelling powerful. Otherwise, what are you doing it for? But isn't it way more powerful when something leaves an impact, an impression on you and you think back and think, you know, this taught me a little bit about seeing my goals through. This taught me a little bit about enduring death. Sometimes these things teach you how to deal with adversity, loss, sacrifice. When is it time for you to make a sacrifice for someone else? Be like, I'm going to put myself on the line to help out this person because I know they can't do it on their own. I feel that storytelling is crucial for humanity to stay humanity. <laughs> What is a world building element in Diamond Dragons that you're particularly proud of and why? So there's lots, Kurt. This is a good question. Good question. People could find this out by, for example, visiting the YouTube channel. They'll see that I've not only made some videos for people to kind of get in the groove of, well, what is this like? Like teaser videos, chapter artwork teaser videos. There's music I've brought, and music is actually really important to the storytelling of Diamond Dragons. In addition to bringing original brand new music, some of which I composed myself and then had, you know, professionals arrange and make into, you know, orchestrated music. I'm very proud of and I had a lot of fun with doing the food and the drinks of the world of Diamond Dragons. I tried to make it a point to when it was appropriate, when the dragons are in the tavern or something, to explain a little bit about this bread type of thing or this meat type of thing or this carrot type of thing obviously they don't have chicken eggs and that would be too earthly mm -hmm. and we want to have things that you're semi-familiar with but worldly lifted into a completely different universe so i had a lot of fun with that so there's actually images of some of these things and the names will give you some familiarity where you'd be like oh i get it that's a take on this kind of food and interesting interesting and then this one's very exotic and, and fun i didn't spend too much time you know like i wouldn't spend an entire chapter talking about food but every now and again when it was appropriate and what works well for the storytelling is this other character Gargigal who is essentially the mix master or the brewmeister, if you will. He's like the, you know, the tavern guy. And he's always, you know, mixing drinks. And he's kind of an eccentric, interesting character. He's kind of like, not a mad scientist. He's gonna try new stuff. He's like, hey, try this new drink. It's pretty cool, you know, that kind of thing. And you're like, oh God, not again, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, they like it because he's a sweet character, he's cool. And he often comes up with interesting things. Part of the fun of the storytelling is also goes wrong every now and again, right? I have like one scene where like, oh great, another drink great thanks G <laughs> what the you know it's like one of those moments and then other times where it's just bloody delicious and there's a lot of those fun moments for fun I put at the back of I don't remember what book it was some recipes from Gargigal <laughs> they're just you know fun I would make these kind of little concoctions for my daughter you know sometimes who uh, shout out to my daughter Caitlin her artwork is at the back of every book which is really cool 
Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun doing that. And of course, I've been reading these stories to her all throughout the time. We found ways to kind of eke in some of the little recipes. In addition, I mean, you know, being able to pick a whole bunch of different possibilities about, oh, the world building, just the locations are beautiful. There's this massive waterfall, this beautiful museum that they use to keep their history and their dead ones, you know, there. It's kind of like a mausoleum museum combined. It's quite a universe that's been built there and picking one would be difficult. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, that's a really tough one for me because I would say a lot of these inspirations have been, well, first of all, mostly people I have never met because it's, he's fresh in mind. Uh, Carl Sagan, for those who are not familiar with Carl Sagan, because they might not be um, since he passed away in the, I want to say it was mid nineties. He's sort of like a old school Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you will, but Carl Sagan created this series many, many years ago called Cosmos. And of course it was about the vast cosmos. He just had a very wonderful and unique way of taking scientific that were very complicated issues and bringing them to the table for you to just understand, you know, in a very conversational way. And he was a very intelligent, calm and collected individual who was like a philosopher, a scientist, you know, he was all about the stars and, you know, what are we doing here? That kind of stuff. And in fact, he wrote a book called Contact, which some people will be familiar with as the film version with uh, Jodie Foster and Tom Skerritt, Matthew McConaughey, other fantastic supporting cast. It was literally about, well, what would happen if we actually, you know, not in a fantastical way, like, oh no, aliens got to shoot him down. He's like, what if in a real world setting, we were somehow contacted by an alien life form, millions of light years of what then? There's a lot of little hidden underpinnings that I've eked into Diamond Dragons as a series. If I had to pick one, you know, I guess I would say, there you go, Carl Sagan. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the entertainment industry, varying industries, I should say, over the past 30 some odd years, and you are, you've been extremely successful, extremely successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes, and I'll explain why. Depends on the definition, obviously. So to me, success is very simple. You set a goal, then you work towards the goal, and then hopefully you've achieved the goal. That's success in a nutshell. Now, arguably, someone might say, aha, but did it make money? Did you get a gold medal? Did you get a girlfriend from it? <laughs> and you might be like, if you're defining things by those things, then it's pretty simple also, because then you can say the definition of success is, and you put in whatever it is. So then you look at the project, and if it led to that thing that you said, then it either was or it was not successful. From my perspective, those things can be very up in the air. It could be anything. Anybody could say anything about what they define it. For me, it's just like, did you have a goal? And they go, yes. I'm like, did you achieve it? And they're like, yes. I'm like, okay, well, it sounds like you were successful with it. And then they might say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I kind of screwed up. I'm like, wait a minute. You, you told me that you achieved your goal. And they're like, well, uh, kind of. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me kind of. You're like, what's, what's the deal there? That's okay. But I want to know. So then partial success, maybe. I was successful with this and this and this, but these aspects, they didn't go so well. I don't like that. I'm like, that's fair. That's a fair, it's a fair assessment, right? So it, Depends, right, Kurt? If someone were to say, Matthew, are you like Warren Buffett, like Elon Musk? And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> do you mean in terms of creative? What are you talking about? Money. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm not rich. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if someone says, then you're not successful, I'd be like, yeah, from that definition, you're 100% right. But to me, it's very simple. If you set a goal and you're like, the goal is I want X and Y and Z to occur. It's great if these other things are blah, 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 but I need X and Y and Z. And if I get X and Y and Z, I'll be very satisfied. To me, that's success. And of course, there's degrees of it. You know, someone could say, but you messed up on that one thing. You're a failure. I'm like, well, I mean, if you want to look at it that way, you could do that. But that seems awfully harsh and a little like, are you OK? You know? Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you, fo why are you focused only on this one failure? I get it if you're like, yo, you set out to do 12 things and you failed 11 of them. Yeah, you did this one with flying colors, but oh, come on, man, that's a failure. People get like 90% of the work, it's excellent. And then people are focused on the nitpicky, stupid little, you missed a sem semicolon over there. Or, mm, I noticed that the line spacing on this page is really weird. I'm not saying anybody said that about my work, but like, I'm just thinking of random things. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> who cares about the stupid little things? Um, so yeah, success to me, Kurt, really is, it's just about achieving your goals. And personally, I've 
worked very hard to that whatever I set myself out to do, I achieved it, you know, um, I have failed projects before and I'm perfectly happy to say aha uh -huh, that one yeah that that never got completed, you know, here's the reasons why some of them were on me some of them were they were on other people because it was a team effort or whatever. It's just like, it's important to just recognize those things and move forward. Which kind of leads into my next question. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh yeah. Failure is the best way to get to success for sure. For sure. There's a great line from Billy Joel's music. Mistakes are the only things that you can truly call your own. And I think that's in Second Wind, his song, if anybody's familiar with Billy Joel. You know, actually, I snuck in a, a little homage to Billy Joel in, at the end of book two. I shouldn't say anything more. I've almost given it away now. <laughs> the only path to success is failure in a lot of ways, I feel. For example, when I was learning to do backflip, and I should really say relearning to do backflip because I had learned it when I was younger, when I got in high school, did it for a long time, then kind of didn't do it for many years, relearned it to do some of my live Star Wars productions. I, you know, I had to relearn it. You're going to fall and screw up a lot. You're going to do poor technique. Eh, you have to try it a lot of times and then mostly fail or do a miserable version of it many times over until you're like, okay, it's pretty competent now. Then you're working on not the competent, but you're like, I need to make it excellent. Now I need to make it where I could do it on a whim. And then in like one production, what I do is I like, you know, as a Jedi, I leap up to this computer console and then backflip off of it to dodge a stormtrooper firing at me and then punch him in the face and do some more flips. And it's like, what the hell? These things take time. Yeah, lots of failure. The, the road to success is just paved with just eaten dirt and gravel. <laughs> right? When you know how not to do something many ways over, it helps you get ever closer to doing something in a, at least a more efficient or correct way. That's just part of it. If people live their whole lives saying, I must succeed on everything the first attempt I make it, you're going to be in your rehearsal mode and sitting in your room contemplating for way too long and you'll never get anything done. But when people are focused solely on their failures and they get like stuck on them, it's just not a healthy way to go about it. You should just keep moving forward. That's the only direction you're going in. You know, don't look behind you. you it's okay to reflect, you know, glance every now and again, have a look, but don't stay there. You're not going that way. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and the fact that they're helping you with your creative endeavors and the fact that you're reading to them and you're bringing them into the world of entertainment, maybe you're, you're inspiring them on their path to being a long lasting creative person, as it were. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That's a really good question. It's a really tough one, multifaceted question. So first of all, I, I can't be sure who I'm inspiring and who I'm not, other than if they like, you know, email and say, hello, and I read this and I want to know more and tell me more. So that's a thing. And I have received some emails were very touching ones from people where they read something. They're like, oh, you know, Matthew, this character, they reminded me of my grandfather and this. And it's really touching, Kurt, you know, fantastic stuff. Uh, and they're of all different ages. But I would say that the most important thing for artists to do is to go through their own hero's journey. You can't have people do it for you. Like if you want to do the things that, say, Steven Spielberg did, you're going to have to start small and do the things that, <laughs> that he did. And he did not begin with Schindler's List or Jurassic Park, Raiders of the Lost Ark, not even Jaws. He didn't. He just simply didn't. The things you don't see are probably the most important things about most artists. Most people never heard of George R. R. Martin until his books rolled into this like bestseller thing. And that's no big deal. He wrote a book and then da da da. I'm like, no, they were there for a long time sitting around. It wasn't like they were not well received, but it wasn't like they were like, dun, dun, dun. Um, Stephen King mentioned that in an interview where you get to see them both on stage uh, going back and forth. It's one of my favorite interviews of two uh, authors. It was a crazy thing for George R. R. Martin, but he'd been doing the work happens for people like James Cameron. He was a truck driver, picking up as much information as he could from the libraries and stuff, photocopying stuff on film work and effects work for the longest time. And then somehow he pitched his goofier movies and got onto the sets of other ones. And then finally was able to get stuff with Terminator, Aliens and whatnot. They didn't know if it was going to be a success. A lot of people would fight against it. The things that I would want to tell these up and coming new artists is like, don't take it for granted, work hard, Make sure you set your goals. If you're going to quit, quit. Don't keep going. 
But if you're, I'm going to see this thing through, I'm like, so then just keep working towards it. Set deadlines. It's important. It doesn't mean you can't, you know, sort of, if you have to push them in certain cases, you, you have no choice, but it's like, it's better to set some deadlines because otherwise, if you don't, you will just keep, oh, one of these days I'll get to finishing and run. I'm like, you're never, you're never going to finish that project. You're never going to finish it. Trust me. I've been there. I've seen people all throughout my 30 plus years who will set, I want to do a production. They have all these great ideas. Of course, everybody has great ideas, but the follow through, the work, super important. Well, Matthew, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure. And it was it's great conversation. We had a lot to say, which is yeah. fantastic. But um, it's, it's my pleasure. And again, if people uh, want to support the work, they can uh, visit the website. Uh, I would encourage them to visit, you know, diamond-dragons.com. The YouTube channel is just chock full of videos, lots of free content. So nobody is under any obligation if they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, purchase. But uh, of course, if they are interested in the books, uh, that would be fantastic. You know, I don't don't have some gigantic audience of millions. So it'd be great to start to kind of uh, uh, letting that ball roll down the hill and gather moss, as they might say. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's TWO. Website's going through a complete revamp. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia, the podcast. You can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.